Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. Now, this is the daily chart of silver. We're going to spend quite a bit of time on this chart because of the the recent move, and I just want to go in depth into a lot of this technical stuff here. So, the first thing that we want to look at is this primary downtrend line that's right here. So, a lot of people would ask, you know, why is this the line? Why didn't you draw it from up here or something like that? Well, it it's drawn simply based on touch points and the way that the market moves. It could have been drawn from higher, but you can see based on the touch points that the most valid trend line to draw is the one that comes from this uh, $23 $24 top here. You can see we get touch there, turn down, touch, turn down, close, and then uh, spike, turn down, and then also a break. And when this break came through that trend line, you can see that this new uptrend line formed. And I covered before how this trend line held. Now, so those are the two major trend lines that we're looking at. And uh, this, this latest move is very, very bullish for a number of reasons. The first reason is that it is um, very, very quick in its uh, reversal. You can see that it's, uh, it's clawed back 50 to 60% of, of the loss in a very short amount of time. Uh, it's not on enormous volume. It, it would be nice to see actually a record volume spike. Then I could safely predict that we're going somewhere up in here if if we had the largest volume on this, but we don't. But another very positive thing on it, of course, is the MACD. And you can see on the daily MACD, we have a positive reversal. Not only do we have uh, a uh, turn up a crossover of the lines but we actually have a zero line cross at the same time you can see we're at negative point oh 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 seven six so if we just get maybe 10 cents on the price uh, this is turning up so now I'm gonna zoom in a little bit so I can remind you of the the MACD buy points and sell points in in the trending market that's something i always point out you can see that we had a very good sell signal here that was valid because the buy signal that followed it was there followed by a lower price but uh, once we got the reversal you can see that one of the big buy signals it wasn't uh, super clear on the charts but it was when it crossed over the zero line here and then we get this huge spike now the sell signal that we got is right there and that's a, a very very clear sell signal and it it uh, coincided with that top there but you can see that was quickly reversed uh, without the MACD reversing and the MACD ground lower and we got a, a price that wasn't lower we got uh, higher lows and then we got an explosive move right here and that uh, coincided with that uh, MACD breakout from just around the zero line then we had this most recent correction right there and you can see that matches this MACD top but you can see now when we pull out that it really didn't uh, it, it was a valid sell signal, but we're starting to move towards this, the buy signals being more valid than the sell signals. And that's, that's what you have when you have a bull market. When you're in a bull market, the MACD buys are valid and the MACD sells are invalid. Just as when you're in a bear market, the MACD sells are valid and the MACD buys are invalid. It's just the way the trend works. So the last thing I want to talk about here on this chart is the overhead resistance. It's clearly at around, I tried to draw the line here the most accurate that I could, taking out most of the noise. There's noise here and there's noise here, a little bit of noise there, but for the most part, uh, this price of $19 is 
a big ceiling. It, it failed here and it was support for a very, a very long time. So if this price can be taken out quickly, it, uh, it could potentially be a very quickly moving market. Um, once, you, once you get above uh, significant resistance, just like we did with this area here, this is the one that I concentrated on before, and you can see we topped up here uh, above just about everything we'd been in except for this little top. Uh, so once we got through that, you can see that it, it, uh, it was very, very strong and it re reacted strongly on this bounce back. So the next test point is going to be $19. Um, something that would be extremely bullish would be a move very, very quickly up through 18 and 19 and 20 and just moving through those prices very, very fast. And of course, there would be a correction. Uh, but uh, that would be an indicator that the bottom is definitely in. As to whether that occurs, that remains to be seen. So we're looking for this $18 price. We're more than 50% back to it. And uh, the last thing is the volume here. You can see the volume trend barring this anomaly here with this strange volume. And again, there's only so much confidence you can place in these volume figures but we're just going to take it at face value and since this anomalous situation happened with the volume in in the end of 2014 the beginning of 2015 we have this steady rise in volume and uh, a large move to the upside with a large up move in volume would confirm that we're going to challenge this area here and uh, be looking at 20 20 plus prices so it's going to be interesting watching this moving forward. Again, stackers have had a very long time to stack. Uh, there's no excuse for fundamental silver believers to not have a gigantic stack at a very, very low price. If you don't have a gigantic stack at a very, very low price, then you are either in a very unfortunate situation and something happened you know, where you just couldn't stack, or you just simply don't believe and you didn't stack. So we're gonna see this moving forward. Now let's go over to the cryptocurrencies real quick here. Um, th this figure is the one that I watch and that's the total market cap and this one is totally inaccurate. This is affected by some strange anomalous numbers. So I'm not gonna take this at face value, but if you remember for the longest time, the overall market cap of all cryptocurrencies was around nine to ten billion dollars. Now you can see with the recent move in Bitcoin that uh, Bitcoin itself is above nine billion dollars. Now we've got Ethereum coming here in second with the I've uh, ordered these by market cap, and you can just click on any of these to order it by whatever um, category you want to order it by. But uh, this is in the order of market cap, and you can see Bitcoin is number one. Ethereum is number two, and it's up around $1.16 billion. So I thought that it would correct. After it hit a billion dollars in market cap, I thought it would significantly correct down to around uh, maybe half a billion, and it didn't. It has not really seriously corrected uh, so far. Now, you have to remember these charts here when you're looking at this seven day price graph, Bitcoin is going to be the only price chart that's in US dollars. Every other price chart below here is going to be in Bitcoin. So you're looking at these other coins in relation to Bitcoin. So when you see these charts going down, you have to remember that you're looking at um, something that is uh, still maybe increasing in value, but just not increasing as quickly as Bitcoin is. Um, so the one that I played for a while is Lisk, and you can see that Lisk is now, um, what is it, eighth or ninth in market cap. You can see a very, very nice um, pennant formation. I would probably, if I'm gonna play Lisk right now, I'd probably buy it if it breaks above that and try to day trade it. So just calculating these uh, sort of back of the matchbook calculation, we're talking 9 billion for Bitcoin, 1.2 billion for 
Um, Ethereum, we're at, we're at 10.2 billion. And then if we add, say, this one, this one, and this one, and all the rest, we probably get another billion. So we're about 1.3 billion in market cap. So that's a significant breakout in cryptocurrency market cap. And Zero Hedge did an article recently on it, how Gartman doesn't understand Bitcoin. No one really understands Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies, but I guarantee you they're not going away. As I said in one of my earlier videos that Jennifer came up with and helped me out with, is that Bitcoin is, it's the uh, currency, it's the new mechanism to defeat capital controls. It's also, in my opinion, the next um, Gutenberg press. It's something that once the idea is out, it's never going back in the box. They can never, that horse is out of the barn, they can never put it back. So the fact that we're around 1.2 billion in total market cap for crypto, I'm sorry, for a 12 billion to 13 billion in total market cap for all cryptocurrencies tells you that this thing is still running and it's running strong. So let's get over to the article I want to cover for tonight. And it's a long article. I'm going to read as much as I can. This is kind of like a an open uh, um, just speculation by Brandon Smith. He's kind of thinking out loud here about what's going to happen. It's called the Federal Reserve's Strange Behavior Makes Perfect Sense. And uh, I don't happen to agree with Brandon Smith, uh, but I, I wanted to go through this and just share with you my insights about what's really going on behind the scenes and uh, what, what they have planned, what they're trying to do, and what they may or may not be able to accomplish. So let's read this. This is called The Federal Reserve's Strange Behavior Makes Perfect Sense. And that's again, that's Brandon Smith, uh, Alt Market. I've made this comment many times in the past, but I think it needs to be stated again here. If you think the Federal Reserve's goal is to maintain or repair the U.S. economy, then you will never understand why they do the things they do or why the economy evolves the way it does. The Fed's job is not to protect the U.S. economy. The Fed's job is to destroy the U.S. economy to make way for a truly global system. Now, I wanted to comment on this idea first. Uh, I can't strictly agree with this statement because if you think about the history of the Federal Reserve, the Federal Reserve was formed in 1913, and then it's, uh, you know, its 100-year anniversary was fairly recently. And if you look at the results of what happened under the Federal Reserve system, the United States became a sort of global hegemon. So you can't argue you can argue that the value of the dollar has decayed significantly under the fed's watch and you can argue even in the last probably 10 20 or even 30 years the lifestyle and the wealth of individual u.s citizens may be taken on a average uh, say some maybe a median average, even a mean average, but on some type of average, you could say that the the well-being of U.S. citizens has declined over the last maybe 20 or 30 years. But you certainly cannot argue that the United States has not become a world power under the Federal Reserve. So this Federal Reserve system, the system of phony money, has enabled the the u.s to become a world military power so i i have to disagree with the fundamental basis of this article that the fed's job was to weaken the u.s i don't believe that's what the fed's job was although that may be what the fed is going to do now as it as the people behind it decide to strengthen another fed and that that may be china that may be Europe, that may be Russia, I don't know. 
but uh, I can't strictly agree with this argument, so let's continue. There seems to be a collective delusion within certain parts of the liberty movement that the globalists, the banking and political elites that promote total global centralization of finance and power, are a purely American or Western problem, and that they have some kind of loyalty to the success or perceived success of the U.S. empire. This is nonsensical when you look at the progression of the American fiscal system after the Fed was established over a century ago. Now, if you remember the interview that I did with uh, Sean of SGT Report, I talked about the attempts to revive the Roman Empire under various Caesars and Charlemagne and um, World War I uh, and World War II with Hitler and now with the EU. And I think this is a kind of a misstatement of the issue. It's not a question of whether or not there's going to be globalization because ultimately we know that there is going to be globalization. But the question is whether the power, the powers that be that are currently in power, the current ruling empire is going to be the one that succeeds. And history tells us that the answer is no because the odds are based on the failures and there has never been a success so far. Again, there will be a success, but there hasn't yet been a success in uniting Europe, in uniting the world. So in my opinion, the odds that the U.S. empire, this empire that has been strengthened, in my opinion, by this Federal Reserve System ability to uh, rob the rest of the world, uh, I would give it about an 80% chance that this this attempt is also going to fail and they're going to have to fall back to the next attempt, whatever that is. In the past 100 years, the U.S. has suffered a gradual but immense devaluation of the dollar's real buying power. We witnessed the first long-term fiscal depression in the nation's history. We saw the removal of the gold standard. We saw the dismantling of the greatest industrial base in the history of the world. We've struggled through the implosion of derivatives and debt, debt and credit bubble, which Fed officials have openly admitted responsibility for. And now we're on the verge of the final implosion of a massive equities bubble and the collapse of the dollar itself. So uh, again, to reiterate the point, uh, yes, the, the U.S. has suffered a, a immense devaluation of the dollar's real buying power. But again, who did that impact? Did, did that weaken the United States over this hundred years where the Federal Reserve has been in power? Was the United States weakened or was it strengthened? What, did the citizens of the U.S. and the government of the U.S. suffer from the devaluation of the dollar? Or was it foreigners who were funding the United States system uh, initially through the Bretton Woods Agreement where the dollar was pegged to gold or next to the petrodollar system where the dollar was pegged to the price of oil? Uh, has the U.S. increased in power under that system or decreased in power? I think you'd have to agree that the U.S. has increased in power under that system. So again, the question is um, what is coming next? And his analysis is, is just not accurate. Uh, we haven't been weakened by this system. We've been strengthened. The question is, is who is going to be in charge of the next system? Let's get back to this. All of these developments require careful planning and staging, not recklessness or random chance. Free market economies tend to heal and adapt over time. Only constant negative manipulation could cause the kind of steady decline plaguing the U.S. ever since the Federal Reserve was forced into being. Again, that's just simply not true. The Fed has had multiple opportunities to strengthen the economic lifespan of America, but has always chosen to take the exact opposite actions needed, guaranteeing an inevitable outcome of crisis. The goal of internationalists and international bankers is to acquire ever more centralized authority and thus ever more centralized power. The U.S. is an appendage to the great vampire squid, an expandable tool that can be sacrificed today to gain greater treasures tomorrow, nothing more. 
So I have to kind of halfway agree with that. But again, the U.S. has been strengthened under the rule of these people. So it's not, in my mind, a question of whether these people have decided to destroy the U.S. from the beginning. Um, every empire is ultimately destroyed. At least that's what history shows us. The question is not um, whether the U.S. is in decline, but whether or not they've decided to stop using the U.S. as their world bully, we'll say, or world policeman. If they, whoever the they is, and again, there's a lot of speculation, a lot of anti-Semitism, a lot of um, finger pointing, Masons, Jesuits, etc. And I, I think I've made pretty clear what my opinion is. But the question is not, you know, is is the U.S. in decline, but is the U.S. going to be continued to be used as the power that these powers that be use to try to bring in their world system. Uh, and I'm not convinced yet that uh, that's the case. It may very well be the case, and this is based on some information from Bible prophecy, that, that China will actually be the next player in this thing. And if one looked at what happened to Britain when the pound was ultimately devalued, the not only was the pound sterling seriously devalued uh, when when Britain began to decline, but also the the bond market in Britain uh, was pretty much retired. Uh, but again, if you look at Britain, then uh, you have to conclude that they didn't go away. They weren't destroyed. They didn't become a third world nation. They just simply slipped from power and kind of became a background player, someone who isn't on the front and center stage. Um, so my guess is it's much more likely that what is going to happen is that this globalization plan will fail again. The U.S. will not be the empire that brings in uh, globalization, that the powers that be will decide to cut their losses with the U.S., and they will move east and use China and other eastern nations to make another play at globalization. And even though there are many that are predicting that the U.S. will rapidly collapse into third world status, if we go by history, uh, we'd have to say that that will take a very, very long time for that to occur. We have countries like Portugal, Spain, France, Britain, Belgium, all of these countries at one point dominated the entire world militarily and economically, and yet they did not collapse into third world status. They just kind of faded away. So my money is on the bet that that's what's going to happen to the United States, that it's probably going to slowly fade away, and that uh, Brandon Smith is wrong, that the globalists will simply shift their emphasis over to the east, begin to operate through them, and, and that the United States will just quietly and slowly uh, shrink and become less and less important in, in world history. And we'll talk to you next time.